Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. What an awesome God that he is. And to start to go through all those things that he is, my Savior, my Redeemer, my Deliverer, my Healer. Amen. We want to go to the Lord in prayer. We need him to be our healer in this moment tonight. Uh, we need to remember uh, Sister Brenda Trout's mother, Carol, uh, Sister Tris, uh, Krista, sorry, Krista, Krista Trout's dad, Jim Lee. Also, we need to continue to remember Brother Terry uh, McGee this evening. Also, Sister Sarah Vasquez, a pastor's wife of COVID-19. Also, all the health care uh, workers giving of their time and of their energy. Uh, we want to continue to remember Jeremy Lowe uh, with his hospitalization and that the Lord would touch him. We need to remember Brenda Williams tonight as well, the health of her body. And uh, also all those that are affected by uh, and impacted, hopefully, by uh, the Prisoner of the Mind Conference yesterday. Also, we remember Sister Brenda Trout herself tonight. Uh, she needs prayer. She's been having some uh, pain and hurting uh, today in her pancreas. So let's ask the Lord to touch her uh, tonight as well. Amen. Those requests with others' requests that you may have uh, in your own homes or families, hallelujah, we can go to the Lord in prayer over. Hallelujah. I, I'm glad that I have a God that's not burdened down with my need. Amen. He's not burdened down with my need. As a matter of fact, he wants me to come to him with my need. And so we're going to do that right now with these requests. Father, I come to you tonight. I'm asking, oh, Lord God, for your hand, the Lord, upon these issues, the Lord, in people's lives. I pray, oh, God, for healing. God, healing, God, for those in need of healing. God, for comfort, Lord, for those in need, Lord Jesus, of comfort tonight. God, be the way, God, for those who are directionless. I pray, oh, Lord, this this evening. God, let your will and your spirit be done in the lives, Lord, of the people. I pray, O oh Lord, today, those that are hospitalized, those, Lord, that are suffering, suffering, Lord Jesus, perhaps with sickness, Lord, behind closed doors in their home. I pray, O oh Lord, today, all of those cases, Lord, of COVID-19 across our land. God, others, I pray, God, with mind battles and, Lord, invisible enemies, Lord God, but they are, Lord, fighting against, Lord, battles of mind and Lord depression and despondency and Lord feeling overwhelmed Lord within their spirits God with this long uh, Lord Jesus time of quarantine the walls may be closing in on some I pray oh Lord today Jesus be the joy Lord that joy unspeakable and full of glory God unto them God and I pray Lord tonight God meet each and every individual at their point of need we know God that you're capable Lord to do so you are that healer and that provider and that savior God be all these things and more God that your people have need of and we will not fail to thank you in the lovely name of Jesus Christ that I pray amen and amen God bless you this evening hallelujah if you needed prayer yourself I just hope you just laid it right there on your forehead amen there's nothing wrong with praying for yourself Amen. And calling upon the name of the Lord for yourself. Hallelujah. God bless you in Jesus name tonight. We're going to continue to worship. Amen. Worship the Lord with us. If you feel like it, stand up where you're at in your house. Clap your hands. Raise your hands. Hallelujah. You don't have to be here to do that. You don't have to be here to do that. Amen. You, you can go wherever you're at. Make that your sanctuary. Wherever that at is today. Make that your place of worship. Hallelujah. Let's worship him together.
Hallelujah. He's a near God. He's as near as the very mention of his name. And it's not how loud that you say it that will make him more near or less near and how quiet you say it, but just at the mention of his name. Amen. He draws near. Two boys on the way to Emmaus speaking about the events of their day and the crucifix of the Lord. They're just talking about Jesus, talking about the things that were happening and just even not speaking his name for the purpose of having him come. Just the conversation about the Lord caused him to draw near to where they were walking and what they were speaking about. And so uh, we get the nearness of God just whenever we speak his name. Amen. I'm glad that he is near. I'm glad that he is close at hand. Hallelujah. I, I feel after him as this Paul spoke to those at Mars Hill. I feel after him if happily I might find him for he's not far from every one of us. And, you know, there's certain aspects of scripture that are just promised to uh, people that are children of God. There are certain promises that are allocated for those of the nation of Israel per se or for those that are the church. But Paul was spoke those words on Mars Hill among a bunch of pagan and heathenistic people telling them that if they would just feel after the Lord happily they might find him for he's not far from every one of them I'm thankful for the nineness a man of the Lord hallelujah we're going to now take an opportunity for an offering Amen. And so as you are preparing your offering in whatever form or fashion that may be, please be advised that there is still uh, the Indiana District Apostolic Crusaders having uh, services and such throughout the week this week outside of normal uh, service times. They're going to have service. Uh, Brother Alex Mason will be speaking and one night this week. The Masons will be doing some uh, song uh, song set one, one night this week. So be be reminded about that and also on the national level uh, every Friday they're having uh, uh, broadcasts live streams taking place as well and so be reminded of that also uh, just another reminder uh, if you don't like trying to find these uh, services that we are having here archived in Facebook they are also being archived on the First Apostolic Church of Mount Carmel a YouTube page, and so you can find that there as well. I hope that you've had time to prepare your offering digitally or maybe the good old P.O. Box 326 way. Either way, it all works the same. Amen for the kingdom of the Lord. Again, don't forget your missionaries. Don't forget your pledges. Don't forget those things that you have vowed, you know, unto the Lord to. Amen for those people that may be dependent upon it. Amen. Thank you, though, uh, sincerely for your faithfulness in giving to those who have uh, not not even just slacked one iota, but just been in, in tandem uh, and adjusting, so to speak, to the times. Thank you so much. God bless you tonight as you give into the Lord. Something about the Holy Ghost. It's a feeling that I just can't explain. Burning deep inside of my soul, the verse says. Jesus came and touched us. Amen. And I need a touch of the Master's hand tonight. Hallelujah. This has been an eventful week, and yet, amen, I am so happy to be in God's presence one more time. I'm going to be turning to the book of 1 Kings. The Old Testament book of 1 Kings, chapter number 11. 1 Kings, chapter number 11. Now, I'm going to tell you from the onset tonight, 
that this may be just a little peculiar. That is, I'm going to start a sermon tonight that I'm not going to finish. I'm not being prophetic in saying that. I'm going to start a sermon tonight that I'm not going to finish. And uh, you'll thank me that I didn't. All right. But uh, every once in a while this happens, a sermon spans more than a service. And so whenever I quit later, understand again that I'm not finished. All right. Matter of fact, there's probably just a certain aspect of this that's going to get preached tonight. And uh, I'm, I'm saying this because I, I don't, we could have a little to be continued that may leave you in the hopeless state, okay? I might preach into the depths of hopelessness <laughs> uh, before we're ended here tonight. But remember, I'm not finished. And so that's just a teaser, I guess, in some regards, so you to come back next Sunday. Uh, but also, who in the world wants to be left hopeless, right? Amen. So bear with me here this evening. 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse number 6. The Bible states these words. Short, little, concise verse here. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. It's so concise. Let me read it twice. And I'm not trying to be a poet. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord. And here's the phrase I want to stand out to us here this evening. And went not fully after the Lord, as did David, his father. I want to preach to you this phrase tonight. Uh, it's a common phrase. But I want to preach to you this phrase. Picking up where you left off. Picking up where you left off. And for our purposes this evening, there will probably be more concentration on where you left off than about picking up, all right? But remember, I'm not finished when I get done tonight, all right? Picking up where you left off. Father, I come to you right now. I pray, oh, Lord Jesus, I know, God, what you have been, Lord, impressing upon my spirit and upon my heart. Lord, throughout this week, Lord, here a little and there a little. I pray, oh, God, today, Lord, let those things, those impressions, oh Lord, come to fruition. God, right now in this moment, I pray, oh Lord, for your anointing. I need God your help. I need, oh Lord Jesus, your aid. God I cannot do this alone or by myself, oh God. But Lord, I need, Lord Jesus, your fingerprints upon my life right now in these moments. I pray, oh God, bring some sense, Lord, of revelation and enlightenment, God, to the lives. Lord, of people and those that would hear, God, and I will not fail, Lord, when I return to my seat or to my office tonight to give you the praise and the honor, God, for what you accomplish, Lord, through this portion of this message. In the lovely name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you tonight. In Jesus' name. Picking up, again, is my subject matter. Picking up where you left off. Just one verse that I have chosen here this evening in 1 Kings chapter number 11. Not very long, not many words uh, make up this particular verse. It's about a man spoken of in the scripture by the name of Solomon. We, many, I should say, not all, but many have some familiarity with Solomon. There was King Saul, and then there was King David, and then there was his son, King Solomon. Solomon is the individual that was responsible for superintending the building of that grand edifice called the Temple of Solomon. It was one of the most ornate and embellished structures that was made unto the Lord, a man that was in the generation of Solomon. 
Perhaps it was the most embellished thing that's been made unto God in even any generation. It was quite elaborate with all of the wood carvings and the gold and the silver and the, uh, if you will, all, all of the lavish uh, things that were within the temple of Solomon. David declared unto his son before he ever left the earth that it must be, this temple must be exceeding magnificent. And his son Solomon answered that challenge. He answered that decree of his father. Solomon spared nothing from concept design to finished product concerning this temple. It was a most glorious structure. But this Solomon that I'm speaking to you about tonight, if I may, it is... Here that we see the same man in 1 Kings 11, the same man that went to great lengths to honor God, instead was now not fully following after the Lord. He did not follow the Lord, or rather he refused to follow the Lord completely. The Bible seems to indicate to us in this little lone verse right here that Solomon did not remain loyal unto the Lord. The, the, the scripture says in First Kings 11, it tells us of what his pitfall or his downfall was to betray his loyalty unto the Lord. The Bible says that Solomon loved many strange women. He loved many strange women, and with his love for them came many strange gods that they had and that they honored. And as a result of that, that caused Solomon's heart not to be perfect with the Lord. The man, might I present to you tonight, that built God a house was now building high places and building houses to accommodate all these strange gods of his wives. Most of the kingdom would be taken away from him during his son's reign, the Bible tells us, because Solomon would never stop loving the women. He would never stop loving the strange women and consequently also never stop loving their gods. The Bible tells us plainly in Scripture that the kingdom that was given unto Solomon was to be established as an everlasting kingdom. It was to be established as a kingdom that would last forever. But all but two tribes of the twelve would be given or left with Solomon and his son. All but two tribes would be ripped away from Solomon, amen, as king and his son, as king and their kingdom. The nation of Israel would be divided at that moment in time and broken apart and separated all because a man settled for something less than what he was promised. He was promised a everlasting kingdom. He was promised a forever kingdom. But because he did not fully follow the Lord, he went not fully after the Lord, and he settled for something less, he would be then given something or get something less. He's settling for wives. He's settling for gods rather than the God of Israel. In essence, he settled in this moment. In reality, he settled for a divided nation rather than a whole and a complete nation that he had had before. He settled for two tribes rather than the twelve. He settled for a torn kingdom rather than an established kingdom. And yet, as I look at the story of Solomon, I begin to see the stories of the lives of humanity. Amen. In that verse and even in his own reactions, his story is not unlike many of our stories. We've all been giving, given to some degree and in some regard promises. We have had in our own lives goals and aspirations, if you will, that has been spoken into our lives or over our lives. We've had, if you will, destinies that we have seen before 
before us and promises that we have seen before us. Uh, our sights have been set on those things that still yet remain in the future. Things that we believe in our spirits that God breathed into us and he brought the inspiration to us and yet we have trivialized those very things by sometimes our very own actions and our very own thoughts. I present to you this evening that concerning some of those promises and those things that even God destinies that God had for us that there's been times that we've settled for less because we were following somebody else's lead rather than his lead. We stopped short because we thought we couldn't make it to where God wanted us to be. We thought we didn't have the initiative or the power or, or the forthrightness in order to get there. We've avoided some destinies because it wasn't what we wanted. It wasn't what we preferred. And still yet there were some others that never arrived at their destinies because they came satisfied at a different leg in the journey along the way. But I found out from Scripture and many stories that I plan on sharing with you tonight and yet also, amen, and the next time that we approach this subject matter, I found out through the pages of Scripture that the tragedy with settling, the tragedy with not fully following the Lord, the tragedy with stopping is that often we suffer losses at the places we settle at. And kingdoms like for Solomon are rent from our lives. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament, a man of the children of Israel. The children of Israel are all too familiar with the cost of stopping. They're all too familiar with the cost of, if you will, settling and not fully following the Lord. It would seem apparent that anyone that had an heritage of being in bondage for 400 years would be ready to leave and that they were. Amen. But the Bible tells us that God's purpose for them was to bring them out of Egypt, bring them out of bondage, but also to bring them in to Canaan, to bring them in their promised land. God's plan was two pronged. It was, it was, it was a good plan. Bringing them out was not just his only plan. That's not where it ended. He wanted to bring them out to bring them in. He wanted to bring them out of bondage to bring them into the land of promise. But the Bible says that the nation of Israel stopped at the Jordan. They would not cross over the Jordan. It was in that time frame. The 12 spies are sent out. They come back and it is the voices of 10 spies that discourage the hearts of almost, in reality, almost a million people. The nation of Israel. 10 voices are discouraging the hearts of almost a million people. Canaan, in God's mind, was their destiny. A land that flowed with milk and honey as it's described. But instead of Canaan, Israel settled for the wilderness. She traded what could have possibly been an 11-day journey from Egypt to Canaan for a 40-day expedition. <laughs> A cycling in the wilderness. And she did all of that for this very reason. Because she cowered. She cowered and didn't go over Jordan. Did not cross over Jordan. Because she was following someone else's lead. Namely the voices of the ten spies. And partly because also she thought that she could not do it based upon the information that they brought back. So not only is there the sway of the voices of these ten, because these twelve are leaders of the tribe. These twelve are chiefs among them, people that they should have been able to look through and have confidence in. And, and yet the Bible says their voices is bringing discouragement to the nation for not crossing over. And because of the information that they brought back, they're starting to uh, materialize thoughts in their mind that, you know what, maybe, maybe we 
cannot go over. Amen. Because of what they're telling us. Can I tell you that Israel as a nation went not fully after the Lord. And because of that, virtually a whole generation of a nation of Israelites. Amen. Were lost. All except two died in a wilderness. They died. Please understand this tonight. They died where they settled. They died where they stopped following. They died at the place where they did not go fully after the Lord. I present to you tonight a question or maybe something for us rhetorical just to ponder on. And that is, isn't it amazing how we will allow other voices to direct our lives, especially when those voices are out of sync with the voice of God? The voice of the Lord had already spoken to this nation and over this nation. Amen. Spying out the land wasn't for the determination of whether or not they could take the land. Spying out the land was just to see what was over there, what the houses were like, what the fruit was like, what the people were like. It wasn't for any determination about whether they could go and do it because God said they could already do it. They could possess it. They could arise at once and take the land. And yet there's ten voices that it's starting to get louder than the voice of God. And these people start to follow the voices of the ten that were out of sync with the voice of God. How many times in your own life have you stopped? How many times in your own life have you not fully followed the Lord? Because you gave ear to voices that were out of sync with the voice of God. God said that's your destiny. That's your purpose. But you allowed other voices that were not in harmony with the king to have influence and sway. Oh, oh my God. Woo. Over your life. <laughs> Listen, I'm not, I'm not trying to incite a rebellion. All right. I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, incite any type of a, a disrespect here tonight. But one thing is sure. Some of those folks must have thought, well, these 10, these, they're, they're our leaders, right? Listen, what we need to put, we need to put leadership to the litmus test that the Apostle Paul put it on himself. The 1 Corinthians 11, 1. He said, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Followers there meaning, be ye imitators of me as I imitate the Lord. Can I tell you this this evening? Again, I'm not trying to incite rebellion or anything like that. But the leaders that are not following God, who have these voices that's getting louder than God, should not be. You do not need to allow a voice that's not following the Lord to become louder than the Lord. Woo! Because if you're not careful you'll find yourself settling when you should be moving. You'll find yourself not full, fully following through and after when you need to be pressing toward the mark. May I tell you that sometimes we follow too easily. Again, this is not target on leadership, but it is a target on leadership that's not in harmony with the purpose of God. Amen. We follow too easily. Hallelujah. I'm not telling you to abandon all leadership. No, that would be ignorance. You have misunderstood and misconstrued what I've said up to this moment, if you think that. But what I am suggesting is this. We need to think twice about who and what we subject ourselves to with our followership. Huh? Because who and what we subject ourselves to may very well alter or at least sometimes delay destinies Woo! in 
our lives. I am here today. I'm purporting. I'm backing. And I'm propagating that we need to follow godly leaders. We need to follow voices that's in sync and in tune with the voice of the Lord. We need to imitate our lives after people and leadership that are, if you will, imitating the Lord Jesus Christ. But please understand this tonight. Let's understand that whoever and whatever we begin to follow becomes a leader to us in that moment. You hearing me? In other words, the moment that you subject yourself to someone, their ideas, their voice, you have become their follower. Uh, folks, there are some things that's leading us in life that doesn't need to be leading us. Because their voice doesn't correspond to the voice of the Lord. Leaders in some people's lives, let me just say it for a moment. Leaders in some people's lives have been addictions of every type. If you subject yourself to it, you're a follower. Leaders in some people's lives are the possessions and the monetary goods that they have. If you subject yourself to it, you're a follower. Leaders in some people's lives are pride. In some, it's lust. In some, it's jealousy. In some, it's anger. Amen. Their voice is not God's voice. Those things are not in sync with the master. Their goal is not God's goal for your life and for your destiny. Well, my God. Someone say amen. When those things want to cause you to halt, you need to persevere. Hallelujah. Praise God. Genesis 11, Genesis 11 and verse 31, the Bible says, Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran, his son's son, Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. Note this here. And they went forth with them from Ur of Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. Terah, the father of Abram, the father of Abraham, we know according to Scripture and other sources, even beyond that, that he served other gods. Joshua had told us, he had told them, the people of Israel, he told them that they had fathers that had dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time. He said even Terah, the father of Abraham, served other God's Jewish writers even support this as well. They underscore that Tira's name, which means deserter and wanderer, they underscore that at one time that Tira may have very well been an inhabitant of Salem or an inhabitant of Jerusalem. Amen. And that he had one time been a supporter of monotheistic beliefs, the belief of one God, but he deserted it. Not just Salem or Jerusalem, but he deserted the doctrine of monotheism. We have no dialogue. We have no record that indicates why Tira was leaving in, in Genesis Ur of Chaldees. There's no insight given to us why he is leaving Ur of Chaldees. But the Bible says he left Ur of Chaldees with the purpose of going into the land of Canaan. We don't know if God spoke to him. Listen, I'm, this is just all just thinking here a little bit tonight. We don't know if God perhaps first spoke to him about going to Canaan before he spoke to Abraham. 
Consider here a moment. We don't know. Perhaps maybe God spoke to Terah, Abraham's father, first and told him to go, amen, to Canaan. We don't know. We don't know if perhaps that conviction struck Terah's own heart about serving other gods, especially if he had been exposed to monotheistic beliefs and perhaps he had been in Salem or Jerusalem before. We don't know if perhaps in serving other gods, all of that just became shallow to him and he felt like maybe once again re-embracing or embracing again the land of Canaan and perhaps the God whom he possibly abandoned at Jerusalem. We don't know. We don't have the dialogue. We don't have the record. Nonetheless, it is again apparent in the scripture that he and his family were leaving Ur of Chaldees with their sights fixed and focused on Canaan. According to the word, according to Bible maps and things of that nature. A straight line journey from Ur Chaldees to Canaan would have been almost 3,500 miles. 3,500 miles. And so the scripture says they were going to come into Canaan, but they came unto Haran and dwelt there. Haran is a fifth of the distance to where they needed to be. It was about 600 miles from Ur of Chaldees to Haran. And rather than go in that long journey, because that's where they had their sights fixed on when they came to Haran, a fifth of the distance, the Bible says they dwelt there. Here is now the one that's saying, come on, family. He's got his family together, all right? He's got the family together for the purpose of leaving Ur Chaldees. No doubt in this, in this moment, being the father of Abraham, he's the head of the family of Lot and even Abraham's uh, 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 wife, Sarah. They're all looking to him for direction. They're all looking for him, to him for leadership. But when they get a fifth of the distance in the trip, the Bible says they dwelt at Haran. There is no doubt in my mind that Tira had some type of influence over everybody else that we're going to stop right here. or We're going to pause right here. And the pause turned into a stop. They dwelt there. See, there's something I want you to understand here tonight. The problem with following another's lead, particularly whenever they're out of sync with of God or particularly lead any any way that you want to look at it. The problem with following another's lead is that when they stop, you stop. You just go, I hate caravans, but now I'm not talking about a, a, a minivan. I'm talking about whenever you have a string of people that's following you or you're following a string of people to a destination because you are at their mercy. When they stop, you stop. When, hallelujah. Whenever they turn, you turn. When they go, you go. And folks, this is especially dangerous when we're talking about leaders. That's not a follower of the Lord. You hear what I'm saying? Because whenever they stop, you're at their mercy. You're going to stop. It's in times like these that I think New Testament Scripture comes into play where the Bible says the blind lead the blind. And guess what? We all fall into the ditch. Someone say amen. Whenever they left Ur of Chaldees, they went to Haran. And Haran was only a small distance of where they needed to go to. For that matter, the Bible says they dwell at Haran. Can I say it like this? That Haran became the new epicenter of their lives. That's where they lived. That's where they slept. That's where they ate. That's where they had their recreation. The recreation. They dwelt at Haran. But the Bible says this as a almost a footnote to all of this, 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 this settling and not fully going through. The Bible says that Tira died. In Haran. Canaan was the goal. But he died in Haran. Haran was their settling place. And Tira was their loss. At that settling place. Can I tell you here this evening. That perhaps Tira didn't go any further. Because though Haran. Was not Ur of Chaldees. Here's the thing. It also, though, wasn't much different from Ur of Chaldees 
as well. Help me, Holy Ghost. Both cities, Ur of Chaldees and Haran, both cities worshipped moon gods. Both cities, Ur of Chaldees, what he left and what he's dwelling at. Both cities had temples unto their false gods. I ask you tonight this question. How is it that we will agree to leave and reach a new location and call that progress when it isn't much different from the quality of the place that we left? Someone say, hmm, I hear it all the time in modern day society. Not just world, but church society. Everybody's talking about progress. Everybody's talking about being on the cutting edge and this and that and the other. Everybody's talking about making progress all the time. But folks, let, let's just uh, peel back a layer of the onion here tonight. Uh, movement within itself uh, isn't progress in the kingdom unless you've improved the quality of where you are now compared to where you used to be. Oh, someone say hallelujah. Mm. <laughs> Can I present to you here this evening, perhaps that is why, perhaps that's why that when God extended this invitation of going to Canaan to Abraham, that he did not stop with simply saying, get thee out of thy country. Watch me now. Genesis 12 and verse number 1. This is what the word said unto Abraham concerning getting out of the country and getting to Canaan. Look at it. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Tear is dead. Get thee out of thy country and from, look now, he didn't just stop with get out of your country, and from thy kindred and from thy father's house. Unto a land that I will shew thee. You know what God is conveying in this moment? Getting out of Ur of Chaldees wasn't enough. Getting out of Ur of Chaldees wasn't enough. Whenever you planted yourself at a location that was similar to Ur of Chaldees. He says, Abram, he said, not only do you need to get out of your country, but you need to get somewhere that has a different environment. You need to get somewhere that has different surroundings. You need to get somewhere Abraham whose quality of environment has been improved and has changed. For that matter, hallelujah, you're going to have to get away from your kindred and get away from your father's house. Someone say amen. Hallelujah. See, the Bible says again, they settled in at Haran. Its name alone, the, the, the name or the location of Haran alone means parched. <laughs> they settled for the parched instead of what would become known as the fertile land, the milk and honey land. Folks, how many times have you found yourself at a place that couldn't quench your thirst, even if you even tried? How many times have you lived where it was dry, lived where it was scorched, lived where it was arid? It's a parched place. Walk with me here for a moment. But before I go on this long diatribe about bad mouth and Haran, too much. Let's not forget just a few things. That the wife of Isaac was sought for at Haran. And Jacob fled the wrath of his brother Esau all the way to Haran. Listen to me very clearly, please. With that in mind there, it's not that Haran was an inherently Bad place. Listen to me very clearly. Listen. But when it's not where you are supposed to be, it will not be what you need it to be. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Canaan was theirs. So if Canaan is what where you're supposed to be, it is going to then be the place that can supply what you need. 
And anything short of that, selling for anything per se less than that, is not going to yield to you what you need. Amen. Because that's not where you're supposed to be. I dare to say right now, and I'm speaking to the first apostolic church members right now in this moment, so get on the edge of your couch. I believe right now that we have had people, amen, be in the church and said in the church that they have lived lives of frustration because they're not getting what they think they should be getting with their relationship with God. My question to you, sir or ma'am, is this. Have you settled? Have you fully followed the Lord? Because you might be expecting something from the location that you're at that it cannot give you your destiny your purpose your promise that's still ahead of you if you would continue and follow is the thing that you'll relish in if you'll get there hallelujah <laughs> again I, I, we might leave hopeless here but I'm, I'm talking about the second aspect of the title right now tonight where, where we leave off where we've left off Bible says, and I usually don't do this, but I am. I have a, a pretty good chunk of text right here that I want to read right now in your hearing. It's going to be like I'm just, you know, reading my text from a sermon. But there's, I believe that we need to hear every word, sentence, and syllable of this particular passage of Scripture of Genesis chapter 19 and verse number 17. The Bible says, this is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot and his family. Destruction is just waiting in the shadows, ready to come, just at the word of the Lord. Verse 17, and it came to pass when they had brought them forth, the angels had brought Lot and his family out of the city of Sodom. When they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, this is the angel speaking, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plains. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast shewed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape, look now, and I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. Behold now, this city, see, Lot is teeing up plan B. Behold now, this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also which I will not overthrow, that I will not overthrow the city for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee. Escape thither, for I cannot do anything. In other words, I can't bring the fire and brimstone down on Sodom and Gomorrah. I cannot do anything till thou come thither to this city that you have suggested. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot, entered into Zoar. Abraham, get out of your country. Get away from your kindred in your father's house. See, Abraham's separation from his father's house and even from Lot eventually happened. The Bible says that when they parted their ways that Lot chose the well-watered plains. And I'm emphasizing with purpose the well-watered plains of the Jordan. And he pitched his tent towards Sodom and he would eventually live at Sodom. As a matter of fact, uh, amen, we understand in the scripture that this man Lot was a leader in the city of Sodom. He was something like a magistrate, amen, in the city of Sodom. The Bible, though, speaks of the condition of Sodom, the condition of the people and the men. The Bible says that the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners exceeding Lee. Hey Amen. It seems that, you know, Sodom took sin into a whole nother level. There was new heights, or it might be better said there were new depths. I don't know. Hey Amen. Concerning sinning in Sodom, they took it to a whole new level. The Lord even spoke concerning Sodom that their sin was very grievous and that he was going to destroy the cities. 
Amen. And the only reason why Lot and his family are standing outside of the confines of the city is because of the Lord's mercy and His grace. And He forewarned Lot a lot because of Abraham's voice and request. But He forewarned them about leaving. And yet the Bible would even describe after they'd been forewarned, the Bible says that Lot yet lingered. And so the angel of the Lord takes Lot and his family by their arms and their hands while they're lingering and leads them out of the city and told them, escape for your lives. Don't look behind yourself. Don't stay in the plains because the plains, not just Sodom and Gomorrah, the plains, all of the plain area was going to be the path of destruction. They said, get to the mountain. So we have, we have a map set set for us. You're at Sodom and Gomorrah and there's plains around that area. You're to leave Sodom and Gomorrah and get to the mountain. That's your destiny. That's where you need to be. And the Bible says that the Lord, hallelujah, wanting to bring Lot and his family from Sodom to the mountain and explaining that to Lot, that Lot speaks up boldly and says, not so. And we understand in Scripture that Lot understands that God has been gracious toward him. Lot understands that God has been gracious toward him. Lot understands because of the actions of the Lord that his life has been saved. He even describes what God is presently doing as as God magnifying his mercy in this moment. He knows what's going to happen here with Sodom and Gomorrah. But when it comes to the plan of God for ultimate safety for him and his family, he says, not so. Someone say amen. Oh, oh, just walk with me here a little bit here tonight. I'm talking about the aspect of where we left off. Folks, the city that Lot lived in, understand this well from the, the scripture here, it was going to be destroyed by fire and brimstone. And you can read in verses 25 and verses 28 and 29 that I didn't read. You can read that the Lord's intention was for destroying all the cities that were in the plains as well. God had a a specified place. It was the mountain that they should go to. The scripture says, lest they be consumed. And Lot says, no. Lot is refusing to go fully after the Lord. Between Sodom and Gomorrah and the mountain was a little city called Zoar. It was a little city, note this, that was in the plains. It was in the area of the path of destruction that the Lord had intended. And Lot is saying, Lord, how about this little city over here? Have you considered this city right over here? It's near... (laughs) To flee to. In other words, from where I'm standing right now at the edges of Sodom and Gomorrah, it's not very far to where that's at. I know it's in the plains, Lord. I know it's where destruction is still supposed to take place. Amen. But would you consider that little city right there that's in the plains, in the path of destruction? It's near to where we are. Zoar was close to Sodom. Amen. But it wasn't Sodom. It was close to Sodom, but it wasn't Sodom. Though it was on the list, amen, of cities that God was going to overthrow. Now you got to get inside of the mind of Lot here. Amen. According to the word of the Lord. Because Lot is saying this. He's saying, God... I can't, I can't go to the mountain because something evil might happen to me on the trip there and I might die. I'm having a hard time processing all this. He's saying, I can't go to the mountain because something evil might happen, I might die. But would you consider Zoar that's in the path of destruction? He's saying, (laughs) 
He's got to remember that the angel just spoke a few words not that long ago that you can't stay in Sodom, Lot. And the plain areas, they're going to be destroyed. You're for sure going to die if you're in those areas. But God, 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 note what the Lord does. He gives, listen to me clearly tonight, He gives Sodom or He gives Lot what Lot wanted. Lot said, consider the city that's near God told him, I have accepted thee, through an angel, I have accepted thee concerning this thing. You're asking to not have to go far. You're asking for me to make an exception to bring in destruction to this, although it was on my list of destruction, because you feel like you might die on your way to the mountain. He says, so I'm going to accept you in this matter. Listen to Pastor McGee. And if I'm not your pastor tonight, just listen. Amen. Very well here this evening. Be careful when you get what you wanted. Especially when what you wanted is what not, is, is what God did not originally say. Let me say that again. Be careful when you get what you wanted. And it wasn't what you originally heard God say. Because getting what you want, that's not God decided to agree with you. That's God getting ready to teach a lesson. And so Lot reasons and he says, if you'll let me go to the city that is close, (laughs) that you are going to destroy in the plains, he says, I'll live. Somebody hear me today. If you'll let me to go to that which is close to where I was, (laughs) he says, I'll live. And so God says, hasten then. Hurry up. I mean, go on and get there because I can't do anything concerning Sodom and Gomorrah until you reach Zoar. It shouldn't take all that much time and it shouldn't be that difficult for you, Lot, to get there since it's near, it's close. And the Bible says that Lot settled in Zoar. Verse 23 says that whenever Lot reached Zoar, that God began then to rain down the fire and the brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah and all the cities of the plains except for Zoar that Lot asked for permission that he could go to and I can imagine Lot in that morning that that moment uh, thinking within himself uh, success I told you God I told you if you'd let me go to that little city there I'd live I told you God if you wouldn't destroy it and allow me to go just a little distance uh, that I'd live yes you did Lot yes you did but did you ever think that you would live with loss? Did you ever think that you might live with loss? Verse 26 of Genesis 19 says, But his wife, remember, Lot's not a lone ranger going from Sodom. Lot's not a lone ranger going from Sodom to the mountain or Sodom to Zoar. He's got his two girls with him. He's got his wife with him. And he might reach the edge of Zoar and think it's been a success. But his wife. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Can I tell somebody here this evening that's just coaxing and trying to coax God to give you what you want, to give you what you prefer. Let me tell you something. When you get what you want uh, rather than what God desired for you, it will never be as appealing as you thought it would be. Uh, No doubt in his mind never thought he would get to that city of Zoar and any of his family would suffer loss uh, or die or expire. Sure, Lot, you got what you wanted, but you also got loss along with it because you settled somewhere you weren't supposed to settle. You did not follow God fully. And forever memorialized in Scripture then is Lot's wife. We even read in the New Testament, remember Lot's wife. It's almost as a monument to not fully following after the Lord.
people have stopped short. Because like Lot, they thought, I can't make it to the mountain. People have settled because like Lot, they have felt like that they might die if they went on and attempted getting to the mountain. They thought they might die because they couldn't get to the mountain. But they never considered what might die if they didn't go to the mountain. Whew. Rather, he stayed close, huh, Zoar, to Sodom. And he suffered the loss of something that was close to him. He stayed close and he suffered the loss of something that was close to him, his wife. And so what he thought maybe was a win to begin with, what he thought was a gain, still overall was a net loss for Lot. I think it's important to talk to families right now in this moment. It's important to talk to husbands and fathers and mothers and wives. And children, talk to families. Huh? Talk to families. Because when you think you can't make it to the mountain, and so, oh God, some people have it set in their mind that the dreams and aspirations God has for them, they can't never get there. And they use that as validity to stay where they're at. When you think you can't make it to the mountain, remember this, mom, dad, husband, wife, remember, some won't even make it to Zoar. Mm, some won't even make it to Zoar because it's too close to where they started from. Like you might be able to make it as though are that close to where you started from. But there's some people, they are not going to make it because if they can't get further away from where they started, they're going to be ensnared in the same destruction of where they used to be. I'm convinced tonight, I don't have any Bible for this, but I'm just thinking in my mind, I'm convinced tonight that Lot's wife being uh, just at near to Sodom, just at Zoar, whenever Sodom and Gomorrah was going to be destroyed with fire and the plains in which Zoar rested was going to be destroyed, other cities with fire. I'm convinced that Lot's wife, as her feet reached Zoar and the fire and the brimstone began to fall, I'm convinced that she felt the heat of the fire and the brimstone that was falling all around. And she knew what that meant for Sodom. She knew what that meant for Gomorrah. She knew what that meant for a place she used to call home. And almost instinctively, she looked back and she turns into a pillar of salt. I don't know. I know this is theorizing, but I don't know. I wonder if the same result would have happened to Lot's wife had he fully followed the Lord and went further to the mountain and got further away from what used to be home and got further away, amen, from what used to be the sinful and wicked place that it was. Folks, we're pitching, we're pitching too many tents. We're making too many dwelling places too close to where we used to be. And you might feel like you can survive there. But honey, you need to consider all your family. They all might not survive there. Hallelujah. Someone say amen. Oh, God. They all might not survive. I'm going to ask the Masons to come. Now you're getting a little understanding why I couldn't put all this in one service. And I'm, I'm trying really. I don't want to try to leave you hopeless, but it's just it's just the dynamics, amen, of, of what the Lord is speaking through his word to us here tonight in the next service that we will engage in this. Talking to you about picking up where you left off. And we're concentrating right now on where we left off, where we did not fully follow, where we settled rather than persevered. Because maybe we're following people 
whose voices weren't in sync with the Lord, or maybe you got the idea you couldn't reach the mountain, you couldn't reach that ever. What if I die in trying to reach it? Well, what if something dies along the way and you suffer loss? Can I tell you here this evening, I'm coming to a close. When we go, not fully after the Lord, as in the case of Solomon, kingdoms are rent from a king. And in the other stories I've shared tonight, losses abound. It's amazing to me that where we choose to settle, we might as well have included... uh, Ear notched, ear ear noted right there among the fact that we've chosen to settle. We might as well include that we've chosen to suffer loss. Because when, when we go not fully after the Lord, what we have done, Solomon, the temple, look at that. Glorious. Tremendous. But when you don't fully follow the Lord, what you've done and what you accomplish up until that moment will carry a tinge then on out. If you never pick up, it'll carry a tinge of what you didn't do. Oh, Solomon's temple, all the gold and silver. Man, there's never been another temple like it. That's awesome. Yeah, that is. But when you have that type of history and then you don't fully follow the Lord, people's eyes look back Sure, the temple is still always going to be great, but the Solomon character is kind of going to get lost in it all. And they're going to have a tinge, all of that history is going to have a tinge over what Solomon didn't do. He didn't fully follow. He had strange wives and strange gods. Folks, I can tell you tonight as I stand here that I, I know people and I know ministries. I know people and I know ministries that have done some very great and noble things for the kingdom of God. But you know what people recall about them? If they never made amends. You know what people recall about them? If they never pick up where they left off, where they stopped following God. You know what people remember? They remember their moment of indiscretion. They remember their moment of not fully following the Lord. I'm telling you the truth tonight. You have somebody they can teach. They can teach 25 Bible studies a month. But if they reach a point in their life that they leave off God and they refuse God and they're no longer loyal to God and they don't make amends, they don't come back to God. People's people's, somewhere along the way, all of those 25 Bible studies a month are going to be flawed by what they didn't do, by not fully following the Lord. As great as the temple that, that the temple of Solomon was and it was remembered as, there is the reproach. Now, if it's a builder not remaining faithful to the God for whom he built it. What that should do to us tonight. Talking a lot about where we left off. What this should do to us tonight, considering Solomon. In that he didn't pick back up where he left off is this. It should challenge us. It challenges me. You know what it challenges me to do? That in the areas and the places of my life where I've grown slack, where I've not fully followed the Lord, you know what it challenges me to do? McGee, you need to go back to where you left off and you need to pick it up again. (laughs) You need to go back to where you left off and you need to pick it up again. Somebody in my viewing audience tonight needs to pick back up a promise that they laid down somewhere along the way. Somebody in my viewing audience tonight needs to silence the voices of those that are not in sync with God and readjust their attention to the voice of God and continue on a journey they've left from somewhere along the way. Somebody in this viewing audience tonight needs to get a gumption inside of them that says, if God told me to go to the mount, then he must going to enable me to get to the mountain. I can do it. I'm going to pick back up where I've left off. I'm going to continue on my journey to the destiny. Hey, hello, 
that God has for me. Because once again, ladies and gentlemen, when you get what you want and it doesn't harmonize with God, God wanted, it will never be as appealing as you thought it would be. Don't just leave off. Don't just stop. Don't settle. Don't become comfortable with not fully following the Lord. Because tragedies and losses are suffered when we settle. Losses are suffered whenever we stop. I'm going to pray right now. They're going to sing, but I'm going to pray. I feel the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you right now, uh, in all of these weeks that we've been doing this, I don't know if I've ever felt God's presence any more powerful during these particular weeks than I feel God right now. And I'm telling you, I know the power of God. And I know His ability to go beyond these four walls. And I'm praying right now in the Holy Ghost, Father, that you would go beyond the four walls of this church assembly. I feel your spirit here, but I'm convinced right now that somebody else is feeling your spirit in their home. They're sitting there on their couch and they are contemplating where they left off. They are contemplating the voices that they have followed that had nothing to do with God. They're contemplating the times that they said they couldn't do it and they couldn't make it. And they're thinking, you know what? Maybe I need to go back and assume my destiny again. Maybe I need to go back and just believe God for it. <laughs> Picking up where you left off. Sorry, ma'am, you need to pray right now in your home. I'm telling you tonight, you need to pray right now. If you've not taken an opportunity in any of these weeks of quarantine to pray at the end of a service, you need to be praying in your home right now. You need to be crying tears. You need to be lifting hands. You need to be hollering out to God. I don't care if your walls are thin and your neighbor's here. You need to cry out to God in this moment. We don't want to just leave off. We want to pick up where we left off. Somebody pray right now as they sing and to the Lord. Finding myself at a loss for words and the funny thing is it's okay last thing I need is to But to hear what you would say, the word of God speak, would you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see yeah, your, your majesty, majesty to be still in the
Holiness, word of God, speak. 